So another beautiful day here. One of the things that we really feel grateful for is that this place prior to us was owned by a nurseryman who really loved plants. And we really received the benefit of having these unique specimens, these larger specimen trees in our landscape. And he really loved Acer palmatums, which are Japanese maples, and also conifers, unique conifers, dwarf conifers. And you often see this in Japanese gardening. You probably saw it in the Japanese garden tour that we did in Philadelphia. A lot of that inspiration came here and they have that on this land. And it's so interesting because these are not plants that I'm really accustomed to at all. It's not ones that I would have initially selected if I just got here and this was bare land. I wouldn't have thought like, oh, let's put Japanese maples and these dwarf conifers on the land because I was more into native plants, for instance. But the thing is, when somebody has a different inspiration for a garden, you start to look at that and you're like, hey, that's unique, that's interesting, that's beautiful. And let me learn more about that. So I am by no means an expert in Japanese maples, which I'm going to focus on today, um, just in general, how to go and select them, their care, placing them in the landscape, just understanding more about that group in general and share what I've learned along the way. And hopefully, eventually, we'll get to a place where maybe we could find somebody within the area that has uh, many different Japanese maples and you could see a range of them because I think that really helps when you look at a whole group of plants and then you get a deeper appreciation for them. And that's exactly what happened to me when I started to learn about some of the plants that the previous owner had planted in the landscape. If I could just step back for a bit, you know, I call this Acer palmatum, which is the scientific name, the cultivar name I'll get to afterwards. But Japanese maple in general, I'll use that very interchangeably, but it's really a generic horticultural term for many different maples and not all maples from Japan, which makes it even more confusing. But obviously like a Japanese maple, I would think, well, that's any maple from Japan. And there's probably like two dozen or so, I don't know the exact number, but like two dozen or so maples from Japan, but not all of them are sold in the trade. So again, that's just a generic uh, overarching term. And oftentimes that, you know, the horticulturalists will use that interchangeably with Acer palmatum, but also other species of maples like Acer japonicum, Acer pseudosiboldianum, Acer siboldianum, Acer shirasawanum, and then like a whole host of other maples that I can't even think of. And like I said, not all of them are even from Japan. And because these have been cultivated, they've been appreciated for thousands of years by the Japanese people, but they've really been cultivated only over the last few hundred years. And over that time, you see a lot of hybrids and there's much fluidity in the group. Now, if you're actually selecting a Japanese maple for your landscape, folks will often say there's a Japanese maple for any part of your landscape. And that's pretty much probably true if you're in like zones five through nine, because they don't really survive in really hot zones or really cold zones. So we're lucky because we're in a zone five, six here. So we could, we can make that work for us. If you're in a zone nine, you're kind of stretching it on the heat zone. So you have to find one that's a bit more heat tolerant. And if you are placing it in your landscape, you'll need to protect it from high intensity sun. And you'll want to have it in maybe a more shaded area if you're in zone nine. Here you could see that this specimen is being draped with some Eastern light. And what's interesting about this plant, I think what people are really attracted to other than some of the interesting forms, this pendulous weeping mounding form is a very popular form of Japanese maple. But what other people look for is the coloration and the shape of the leaf. And that's actually how horticulturalists or nursery people will start to actually group the plants. 
But what's very charming about it, especially since we've been here for seven seasons now, is that Japanese maples really look beautiful in all seasons. And part of the charm of them is that they are like chameleons in the landscape. They'll change color over the many different seasons. So in the spring, you'll see that this one has this like Merlot crimson color, and it really maintains that color. In, fa in fact, it like intensifies and brightens in the uh, summer months. And then as it, in the fall months, it starts to kind of wane again. And then in the winter, all of these leaves start to fall off. And I don't know if you could see, but this nakedness of this gray, bra gray branch and the structure is actually very aesthetically pleasing. Now you'll see as I pull back these leaves, this sun is really intensifying that red color. This green is showing that it's not getting as much sun. So it actually just becomes like this green maple. So if you planted this in the shade, which I'll show you on the other side of the house, we have the, I believe it's the, the same cultivar. It's practically green with little bits of, of red in it. So. Oftentimes, you know, if you have a hot, dry summer, which most of the time we actually do here, it will intensify the color going into the sum late summer into the fall, which is important to note, especially when you're actually planting them in the landscape, if you want to get the, the best out of them, you know, if you will, because most of the folks will want to, to go with this colorway. Now, initially when I got here, like I said, I didn't know very much about Japanese maples. I knew they existed, but I wasn't really knowledgeable of the cultivars. And even now, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm so nascent in learning about all these uh, cultivar names because there's definitely over 500 cultivars. Most of them are Acer palmatum. Some of them are Acer japonicum and others are kind of like hybrids. So this is an all Acer palmatum. It's in the dissectum group and I'll talk about the grouping very soon. But it's an Acer palmatum and I think from looking at the leaves it's a Tamukayama. And Tamukayama is a Japanese cultivar name. And I don't speak Japanese by any stretch of the imagination, but you can look up the names. And what you find is that the cultivar names are just really lyrical. They're so poetic. And this means tribute to the high mountain. I don't know, but you can imagine that this is the shape of a rounded mountain, or it could be mimicking a mountain in the distance. There's all these sorts of things that have many layers of meaning. planted by the house, but oftentimes this type of mounding habit would actually be planted on a pond or a lake and then have a reflection in the lake. And so somebody standing there might say, oh, this just means for me to just go with the flow. So I like those layers of meaning because you could actually build that in to your garden design. And you may recall that this was, I did a shade garden tour and how we've been planting this out with more herbaceous perennials. And there really were only three plants. There was this Pendulus pinus strobus, there was this creeping Picea abies, and it was this Acer palmatum, Tumukiyama. And I really took the color inspiration off these leaves and the shape of the leaves for some of the herbaceous plants that I've planted in here, including these violas which has that Merlot crimson hue, and these uh, geranium purple ghosts, which again have that intense purplish aubergine hue. This geranium as well, Samabor, which has some red splotching. Even these hookahs right here that have that red and that kind of acer shaped leaf, which means a maple shaped leaf. These are things I looked to that plant in order to shape the rest of the bed. So, in a way, I am influenced by the folks who passed here before me and how they actually shaped this land. And instead of taking something as exquisite of a specimen as that out, I really wanted to lean into it and bring more of that into the land, which again, it's shaping me as 
a gardener and a, a landscape designer here on, on my own land. And I like that. I like that you could be influenced by other people's choices and then you could kind of mold your own into it. So going back, these are three more specimens that I recently got and I'll probably end up planting them up later. And you could see that these habits of these plants are very different from this one. So you have this more upright variety. And this is called Cherry's Jubilee, <laughs> not as metaphorical as some of the Japanese terms. This is actually a selection off of another one called Sango Kaku, which means coral tower. And you could see why this bark is part of like the coral bark maples that have this really rich red stem. And then it has this, starts with this very bright light green and then it transitions into i believe a very deep lemony yellow into the fall and again it has this more vase like upright habit there's some dead bits on here so i'll definitely be shaping it a bit more and that's one thing i should say pruning in the japanese maples they really take well to pruning you really can't go very wrong with pruning a japanese maple Oftentimes, the best time to do it, I would say, is in springtime when the juices are running, if you want to actually influence growth or different types of branching. If you want to limit the growth, which I may want to here, because if you could see, this is starting to hang down into the bed and onto the other plants. And I might want to choose to come in and just snip this, you know, back to a place where I could actually see some of those plants. So if I want to limit the growth of this, the best time to do that would be in late summer when it's really put out a lot of its energy. And then you could also prune, I like to prune in the winter months, particularly on this plant, because then all you see is the structure of it. There's no leaves and I could see what may have been dead or dying back and I could also crawl under it and then prune more easily. It's very hard to actually go through here with all the leaves. You don't want to break it. But you could see that this is a more upright structure. This one is a dwarf. So I got this, which is called Rhode Island Red, which is actually my favorite type of chicken, actually. So I may have gotten it because of the name and also the fact that it is a dwarf because I saw this more as a container planting that I could do and we could include it on our porch. And so it would kind of bring the Acer palmatum closer to us, not only just in the landscape dotted throughout, but kind of play with that thread throughout and have it closer to the, the home. One thing I should say about planting Acer palmatums in zone five though, and maybe even in zone six, is that you could get those cold winters and you'd wanna make sure that you're using a frost proof planter so that the roots don't freeze or anything along those lines, or that you could take it in and maybe make it a patio plant or put it in your garage like you would if you had like a non hardy fig. This one is called black lace. So it's also this kind of smaller upright variety and it doesn't keep as small as this, which is I think at maximum height, it'll reach around a six by six. This one gets to about, I would say 10 feet tall and maybe not as uh, wide. So they have all these different kinds of habits. And in order to get the same cultivar, or the same cultivated variety or the same selection, you will have to graft the tree. And a graft is basically taking that selection of the upper half and putting it on a rootstock. And oftentimes the rootstocks are off of a two-year-old Acer palmatum. And I mention it because when planting into a landscape or a container, you will never want to bury that graft. You'll want that graft to be maybe two to four inches, at least two inches above the soil or else like if you bury that graft, you risk having it to die back or having some of the old root stock actually come in and then you won't have your cultivated uh, variety anymore. But 
One of the things that I think the nursery people and horticulturists took sympathy on is when you're actually selecting one for your landscape, and I've just showed you four that look very different from one another, they started to group them so you could understand what you're actually selecting. And oftentimes they group them based on the leaf shape, the form of them, and the color of the leaf. So if you look at these and blur your eyes, you're gonna be like, oh, these are all the same, but actually they're not. So if you look at this one, this black lace, you could see that it's highly dissected all the way up to the petiole. And it has these kind of rough, deep sublobes, right? So this is probably in the dissectum group, I would guess. There's other groups, there's the Matsuri type, there's the palmatum type, which looks more like the palm of your hand and it's not highly dissected. So this actually might be in the palmatum group. There's the ammonum group and then there's also the linear lobium group, which has very linear leaves and they're highly dissected. Here's another one. And you could see just in contrast to the one that I showed you, it has one, two, three, four, five lobes. It could maybe get up to seven. I see two lobes behind here. And you could see that it's finely serrated. It doesn't have those deep sublobes and it's not dissected all the way to the petiole. So that's something that's a, a defining characteristic there. And then you'll see this one, which has kind of like this double serration of the sublobes and it's only dissected about halfway down to the petiole. So all of these things will allow you to determine, well, what is the leaf shape that I like? You know, this one's highly dissected. It gives it more frilly, lacy look. They're often called the lace leaf Japanese maples. So you could see that here. And again, look at how highly dissected this is and how highly dissected the sublobes are. So that's a consideration that this, you know, this is a more vase shape and some of these will actually, but it's, it's more contained. And then I could show you this one over here, which is one of the other older specimens that we get to enjoy. And this had quite a lot of dieback when we got here. So we had to really open up the shape a bit more. I think this is probably the iconic blood good. So the Acer Palmatum Blood Good, and this has really been a, a standard for a lot of cultivated species. Just the way that the color of the leaves look up against the sky and, and how they reflect with the sun and the, the shape, you know, this kind of vase shape to, the, to this upright nature. So again, you know, this is not something that I would plant in a small bed, right? Because it's, it's quite large. And oftentimes if you go into a nursery and you're going to buy a Japanese maple, you'll want to look at the size that it's going to be in 10 years time. And they will often give that size. So in 10 years, they might say, this will be uh, 12 feet high and 10 feet wide, right? But I should say something that is maybe intuitive to some, but not to everyone, is that after 10 years, a tree still actually grows. So it might grow slowly and a lot of the dwarf varieties are just really slow growers, but plants will continue to grow after those 10 years. It just tries to give you a 10 year point mark so that you could determine where to actually place it within your landscape or within a bed or how to bonsai it, which I should say that these are very popular, if not the most popular bonsai trees. This is another one that I actually do not know the cultivar name of, but you could see that it's the, in that dissectum group. It's basically like a, more of a chartreuse orangey bronze color. And this has had a lot of dieback. So I'm gonna have to come in here and do quite a bit of trimming and shaping of this, which will actually be fine because one of the things, even if this becomes sparser, say you have a lot of dieback to these leaves, Look at the structure of this. Look at the trunk. It's so gnarly and it just has so much old man character to it, doesn't it? So I wouldn't mind if actually we had to clip this back. And I know this tree has been through a lot because 
I think it got plowed over. <laughs> and then it gets a lot of snow on it too. So let me walk you over to some of the other selections that we've actually made in this landscape that are, you know, again, paying homage to what was here and, and running with it. And again, like I said, I have had such deep appreciation for some of these plants that had been selected and it allows me to educate myself more about them. So if you walk over here, this is the memorial garden that we had started for, it's nowhere near finished. So it's, it's a lot of plants in here, but we really wanted to carve out this bed as a memorial for the person who came before us, who really planted a lot of these trees and that we received benefit from. So we have a video to, to show you more of that. But this again was another type of dissectum here. Again, I'm not sure what cultivar, but it is grafted onto a taller tree and it doesn't have that same vase shape. It kind of has this unique crooked shape to it, but it's beautiful and it has this color pattern that I really wanted to run with in this garden. And you see this beautiful Abies con color right next to it. So it has this kind of contrasting red blue. So we went with a lot of that kind of coloration below in this bed. And I wanted to plant in the front of the bed, but that would pay homage to what was already planted in this bed. And this I found is a dwarf cascading variety called red filigree lace. And this has some of the thinnest leaves and sublobes of any cultivar. What you have to be cautious about when choosing leaf color and leaf shape or at least something that I'll make you aware of. I wasn't quite sure whether I should plant this here and I see that it has some dieback or it has a little some crispy bits. If you have a lot of wind, then it will have a tendency to dry out really lacy leaves. This would be a great container variety that's close to the house that doesn't get a lot of the wind whipping at it. But I wanted to take a chance here because I thought this would be actually a perfect sighting for this. Now, if you have those leaves that are the darker red color, they can withstand some of the sun and the heat. So as I was uh, you know, sharing before, if the leaf starts to turn green and it's a crimson colored leaf, it's probably not getting a lot of sun. Now, um, if you wanna go with the more reticulated or variegated varieties, some that have no chlorophyll or little chlorophyll, or they might be pinks or whites or sandy colors, those need to be protected from hot afternoon sun. So that is something to consider when you're actually, you know, purchasing your Japanese maples. So anyway, this is one that I cited and selected specifically for this garden bed to really play off some of those colors. And then I'll walk you over to another part of our landscape where we have another one of the Japanese maples. You start to see I'm bringing in some of that red tone that the Japanese maples are giving off in the landscape to plant other trees that are red. And we're lucky because the spongy moths have subsided and the leaves are coming back on some of these trees. So I can show you that it's actually uh, red leaf trees because before they didn't have any leaves. This is another one and it's in the shade of this maple here. This is a more upright variety, very similar to the blood good. And you'll see, well, here's a little spongy moth right here. Now the spongy moths don't particularly love the maples, but they will eat them. And that's what some of the noshing that you've seen. But they've been pretty resilient in the landscape, which is really good for, for us to have something with leaves during a time when you have plague like that. But um, yeah, so this one's uh, much smaller and you can see there's some dye back here. So something that I would do is I'd come in and maybe clip these off and would open up the shape a lot more. But again, this kind of red really stands out and dots in the landscape. What I will say, some more of the interest that these plants have throughout the landscape is that they actually change color over many seasons. You might have that Tamukoyama start out crimson color and then intensifies during the summer months, will intensify during the fall months and then you know loses its leaves and it has that beautiful gray white bark. But some might start out yellow, some might start out chartreuse, orange, like bright green. 
so many different colors and then have three or four different colorways throughout the seasons. Let's go here, this is really in the, the shade. So we won't stay here very long, but I'll just show you for contrast. So I believe this is the same cultivar as the one on the other side, a Tamukiyama. Very similar at least. And you could see that it's less crimson and far more green. And it's for the precise reason that you see, we're in the shade here. So you don't see that intense crimson color. You may see it on some of these new leaves coming out, but then they'll start to harden off to this kind of like more purplish greeny bronze color. And that's okay too. It's, you know, it's protected here. Um, we could probably open up the shape a little bit more. And I know that this is really, <laughs> it's probably started off small, but now it's really growing up onto the house. And that's one thing that, you know, Sandra had mentioned to me, like, please trim it off the house because we will need to refinish the side of the house, which is true. <laughs> All right, take you to the last one. This is a new one that we've, we've actually put into the landscape. Actually, before I show you the last one, I'll, I'll show you the inspiration I think that the previous owner had. So again, this is a, a beautiful large, call it half lake. And you could see that there's these different colors over on the other side. So I think he had the intention of paying homage to a Japanese garden. And then they often will, in the right day, reflect in the water. You know, that is, I think, the inspiration that he was going for. And, and, and so we're going to lean into that a bit more and actually play with that color pattern and work on landscaping the ponds. And it maybe will start to happen a little bit this year, but will likely happen in, in 2023. So you may recall that we went to Coldwater Pond Nursery. If you haven't seen the episode, it's really good. I mean, he just does some amazing varieties of plants. One of the largest grafting nurseries here on the, in the east. And he specializes in Japanese maples, a lot of Acer palmatums. And one of the ones that we were really taken aback by is this one called Lazy Leaf. And I don't know if it has a Japanese cultivar name. I don't see very much about it. It might be one of the newer cultivars. The reason why it's called Lazy Leaf is that the leaves kind of start out hanging like this. But the color was fantastic. So you see it has these red stems, new red stems, and this, I don't know, like rusty orangey coral color. And you know, it gets a lot of sun here, but you see kind of towards the north side, it has more of this um, chartreuse kind of color. So again, you could have many different characters to one tree on that one tree. And I'm so glad we got this because we are, uh, putting in a raised bed and a gazebo that has this kind like, of rust color to the stones, to the gazebo. And we're going to play off that rust color with these trees. And as a matter of fact, because our stones around here are this kind of bluish shade and orange shade, and those are contrasting colors, that's what we're going to start to do within this landscape of that kind of rusty, red, rusty, orange color. Now this will turn different colors during the fall. And again, like I said, that's part of the charm of these Japanese maples is that they have these different colorways. Your, your landscape really changes and they change with the landscape. And then because we're going with this color pattern, we'll start to bring some of that color pattern in and around the pond area and dot that in with some of our native specimens. And I know we have a lot of die off around the pond because of beach bark disease. We have die off from the ash borer so we can actually remove some of those plants and start to plant some of the others in. That Cherry's Jubilee one, that coral bark na uh, maple, that will be one that kind of will take inspiration of this kind of red stem. I actually had a coral bark maple planted here around the spot, but I planted it I got excited and I got planted, I planted it before we had the deer fence and it got completely eviscerated by the deer. So what's the deer pressure on this? The deer pressure typically won't happen during the growing season because like the spongy moth, the deer don't really love eating the maples, but 
in the winter months when it's snowy and there's not a lot to eat, they get desperate and they'll eat just about anything. So they ate off the tips of the maple. Now you'll see that we have this, you know, kind of tree guard down below. And that's just to prevent any voles or sometimes rabbits from stripping the bark. But in the winter, we may have to consider actually putting some fences around these for, in the case of like deer or rabbit pressure or anything along those lines. So that's a little bit about what I know about Japanese maples and hopefully it gets you more interested in the group as well. If you're finding value in the videos we produce, we'd love for you to subscribe and hit the notifications button here on YouTube. We're committing 10% of our Google AdSense revenue back to projects in the Finger Lakes region. So your viewership is not only appreciated, but contributes to the community here. We'll see you in the next video.